I still find it extremely emotional to talk about. <laughs> It's okay, that's good. That's <laughs> yeah. Right, Sue, Sue, Sue Watts. Hilary Kite. Jeff Kite. Tom Watts. Sue Kingston. And Julie Lively. And Jenny O'Neill. Okay, so <coughs> Brownsville Gloucester is an amazing team of many people, a core group and a much, much wider group of uh, Gloucester citizens and, and people from outside Gloucester as well that have been part of the sort of wider team. I guess it all started with, um, the roots of Groundswell Gloucester started with the Gloucester Environment Group many, many years ago in 1989, which was founded on climate change issues and environmental issues. And through sort of the periods of coal coming to Gloucester, as in Stratford Coal, um, Gloucester Coal, it was called then, there was concern with the Gloucester Environment Group about what was happening there, monitoring what was happening, and lots of members from that group actually morphed into various other groups, such as the Barrington Stroud Gloucester Alliance. Um, there were groups called GRIP, Gloucester Residents in Partnership. So there are about five groups in all that morphed into Grounds for Gloucester in 2012, 2013. And all of that combined expertise, um, wisdom and knowledge and passion to make sure that our environment was cared for then progressed into the AGL, um, coal gas, the coal seam gas field um, debacle that it turned out to be and, and win. And now currently Groundsville Gloucester are firmly have their sights set on defeating Rocky Hill, Gloucester Resources coal mine proposal and we will be in court throughout August um, to make sure that we are able to put our best foot in there to, to win this court case. Because it looked like that was one, didn't it? Like it was one, one of the first mines to be rejected, but they're appealing, is that the yeah, story? Yeah, it's a really interesting scenario for New South Wales. It's the first sort of time it's happened. They, um, the Department of Planning um, recommended refusal of the application and the planning assessment Commission refused the Rocky Hill coal mine in December. So then Rocky Hill lost resources, put in an appeal, and because it was a public meeting instead of a public hearing, they had rights, merit, merit, merit appeal rights. Um, so that's why we're in court now. However, the upside to that is that it's brought a lot more people together. We're adding climate change, which is something a lot of us are passionate about to that court case. And it's actually shown, I think, the rest of people in New South Wales that there's a way to fight some of these cases. And EDO New South Wales have been incredible in supporting us, not only with this, but with AGL and the coal seam gas field um, situation. So I, I personally think what's been absolutely amazing in Gloucester is the volume of work that's been done from, from so many people, but also how many people have come together that didn't previously know each other to fight both of these situations, coal seam gas and coal, and the external groups that have come in to support us. And the networking has been phenomenal. The people becoming, the, the relationships and friendships that have um, evolved have been fantastic. So yeah, I actually feel quite optimistic. <laughs> When you became part of Groundswell Gloucester, was that from the beginning or somewhere along the track? And how hopeful were you that the campaign was going to succeed? Um, I was there right at the beginning of Groundswell, not at the beginning of VGSPA or GRIP, but I was there when Groundswell started. Um, at that point, I thought that if we followed the processes if we found out the problems with AGL's proposal and also with the coal mine and brought them to the government's attention that um, these would be stopped because neither of the projects made any sense. Um, and I thought if we could just show how they didn't make sense that they wouldn't be allowed to go ahead. 
for people of faith, whichever faith that is, so I think most most faiths have a mandate within them that we should be striving for social justice, we should be alleviating poverty, we should be looking after this world that we all share. Um, so for me, whether there was hope of a positive outcome or not, it was the right thing to keep fighting. And I really felt um, it was quite heavy on my heart that I needed to keep fighting regardless of what the outcome was going to be. Um, and along the way, there was hope, um, not from the work I was doing maybe, but from what other people were doing in terms of there were positive things happening. Um, and because of my involvement with the networks fighting the inappropriate mining, um, positive things were brought to my attention, such as you know, new renewable projects, um, community building projects, um, and lots of positive new technologies and things that are happening around the world, which I wouldn't have known about if I hadn't been fighting against the inappropriate mining. So there, there was hope in, in those kind of fringe things that I heard about, even when it wasn't there in the work that I was doing. Thanks, Jenny. And what about the rest of you that, when you first began, how hopeful did you, or when you first joined the movement, how hopeful were you that it was going to succeed? Sue? Um, I didn't even really consider that. It was uh, always just, I guess, a sense of what my conscience was telling me to do, uh, that this is the right thing to do, um, that uh, we need to take care of our earth, uh, it's sacred. Uh, the, I didn't really go into that fact of whether it was going to be successful or not. Um, yeah, just doing what I believed was the right thing to do. I see other people nodding at that. What about, John, once you'd actually, through the campaign, has your level of hope waxed and waned or is hope even something you've thought about? Uh, not a great deal. I suppose when I first got involved, I, I sort of got dragged into it by Julia, I think. Um, I didn't come and volunteer. Uh, Julia asked me. And I think if I'd have known the magnitude of the task, I would have had felt little hope. If I'd have realised how difficult it would be to try and defeat AGL, um, who had an approval for this project, I probably would have said, well, we're wasting our time. You know, it's, it's not worthwhile. And I had no uh, conception at that stage of, of how we were going to go about doing it. So I was sort of in the dark a bit, and I think that was an advantage because I just then got involved, and as I got more involved, I suppose what hit me was the, like Julie, uh, Jenny's talked about, the injustice and the unfairness of the whole thing. Um, it w it came, became clear to me that this was a case of big corporation and big government simply trying to roll over a small town and get its own way and saying to people, get out of our way, we've got the legal rights. So I think gradually I became more and more, I suppose in a sense angry, and not, not, not yelling and screaming, but offended is probably a better word, by what was happening. And, that then, and then I sort of looked at it as project by project. Jenny and I and others worked on things, <coughs> particular aspects of it, and you get involved in the particular project you're doing, like um, trying to disclose AGL's lack of compliance with the donations laws and lack of compliance with the regulations. And once we get stuck into that, it, they were, that was interesting on its own. So I, I, but I didn't think uh, about whether we're going to win or lose all that much as we went along because we got actively involved. And I must say, when we did win, it was a, a pleasant surprise. <laughs> Well, it was. I mean, I, you know, it sort of came out of the blue a bit. Um, we sort of had an idea that we were winning, but we really didn't know. And uh, anyway, we, we heard that got the phone call and didn't believe it at, to start with, and and then uh, <coughs> went down and had a bit of a party. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that... I, I've been uh, kind of involved in, in some of this process for, for, for a bit longer than, than some here, I suppose, but not, not as long as Jules <coughs> lady, by any means, but, um, but I was involved in the Alliance earlier on, but somewhat off and on with the Alliance, depending on, on you know, that was a difficult process as well for all kinds of reasons, 
and, um, and, and certainly the experience that, that we'd had through the Alliance with what was happening with Stratford and Girelli was, was certainly not encouraging in, in, in terms of, of how we might go uh, with, this, with this new project that we, that we didn't really even properly know was, uh, was, was on the horizon. But uh, it was a case of uh, all of a sudden um, hearing that this, this absolutely massive uh, gas field project was, um, was, was approved. You know, the government had approved the project on the slimmest of information and, and, and that's one of the things that, that, that um, yeah, made me angry about it, was you just look, look at the kind of assessment that was done on the whole project, and it was pathetic. The assessment was terrible. The, they hardly even looked at the whole issue of fracking. Fracking, fracking was kind of just assumed that, that you know, that's part of the mining, so don't worry about it. Um, and, uh, but the assessment in, in had little on fracking, the whole set of conditions that the government came up with um, for the project were, 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 were pathetic as well. Um, there was no way with the conditions that were set out that they would actually um, you know, have any real proper regulation. Um, and the, the government just had no idea about how they were going to do the regulation. Mm. And, um, and, and so, so yeah, you, you, you do get some anger up when you see, see how, you know how, how, what little information the government seemed to need um, to to approve the whole process, mm -hmm. and and but I, I also you know got strongly interested in, in in the project because of the social justice issues. I mean the social justice issues were were very very uh, clear, um, and I suppose a, a, you know a lot of us got to know people uh, that that were going to live either in or around the, the gas field. Uh, or knew them beforehand. We just knew that that this this was going to be a terrible thing for them to endure, and and you know that we could talk for a long time about that as well in terms of of both physical and psychological health and 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 the problems that that this, this project in particular caused caused along the way. And, and I think also um, the social justice thing is very is very big. I'm an eternal optimist, but I think as a grandparent, I think. There was a lot of people that got involved at my level that had become grandparents, and I think once you realise that that is so that makes such an important um, impact on you that you really need to to consider your grandchildren and, and future generations. And I think the whole way through, I was totally optimistic. Um, we had points where I was very down. I must say we had very, we had a lot of sadness, and it changed a lot of our personalities. I joined as a, a knitting nana which is something totally different to what I've ever done. I'm a private school educated child, you know. I, um, yeah, I got dressed up in yellow and black and went down and walked, you know, and did, oh, the things we did. Dominic, um, Jacobs and myself, we started the Nanas in Gloucester. And um, gradually people joined and followed us. And for my mild-mannered temperament became quite angry at times and I learnt words I never knew in my head. <laughs> But we became passionate about it. We met every single week. We'd sit outside AGL gates, and we'd go. To, we'd march down to the the Fairburns Lane. We just we became very militant. Mm. I suppose that's. But but I think the bottom line was it was the climate issue, social justice, and the fact that we needed to leave an earth for the children that was habitable. I mean, it was just disgusting that they could be taking this away from future generations. Our children need water, fresh water. And that was our bottom line, I think, the knitting nanas. So where in this process, um, like picking up a lot of the references to anger and frustration, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, that often reminds me of the story of Jesus kicking over the tables in the temple and disrupting the economy, and, um, yeah, and so not just preaching that we ought to all be loving each other, but then disrupting the system that wasn't. Um, so at some point, maybe you moved from looking at the legislation and looking at the paperwork and going, well, this is clearly wrong. We just need to point out to the government, um, you know, the truth, and then it will all be sorted to realising that wasn't going to be enough. So where did the decision to kind of start disrupting things and not being pleasant little citizens that, you know, wrote letters come in, or was that always there from the start? I, I think it's a gradual thing that uh, as you go along, and you realise uh, we had my first uh, involvement was a meeting 
I attend with some government officials and and uh, and then you put in submissions and you realise they're just being treated with contempt. So it, it, in my personal case, it just gradually built up and up and up. And uh, and then you just realise, well, the gloves are off. Uh, they're not going to fight fair. So we're not going to fight fair, although we did fight honestly, I think, because we were very careful always to make sure that whatever we said was accurate and true. Um, we weren't, we didn't engage in the kind of um, misleading information that the government and AGL were putting out. Uh, so in my case, I think your you kind of uh, way of fighting <coughs> develops as it goes along. But <coughs> it's not just Gloucester. I mean, Julie and I and Jenny have just been up to Darwin and to, the, to Mataranka, where they're looking at fracking 50% of the Northern Territory. And we met with a whole lot of traditional owners and their wishes are being completely ignored. So it's a disparity of power. There's this power thing, which is getting worse and worse, where the rich are getting richer, the powerful corporations are getting more powerful, and the, and the poor and the downtrodden are just getting ridden over. So it's, it's, it's really part of a bigger social added problem, I think. It's not just Gloucester's a, an illustration of what's happening all over the world. Mm. And, and I think so that the hope for Gloucester was that you had a good team. You had um, strong people with expertise, um, or we had. Um, I was sort of like on the second tier of this, I didn't get very militant or anything like that, but um, my hope was always in you guys doing the fighting for the rest of our town. And, and, and I feel for those people like up in the Northern Territory who might not have those strong leaders or, or experts in different um, areas that can fight for them. Because I think that's, it's really, I sometimes feel really hopeless about what our government can do over and above what the people really need. Yeah. Um, I think disruption is on many levels. So I think you've got disruption from a pragmatic viewpoint where you collect the data, analyse the data, put it together. That becomes, I call it a bit of a weapon, that becomes your tool to sort of go and do some political disruption and some corporate disruption, which is like the um, uh, go, going to the politicians to say, you know, we're going to hold you accountable, you're culpable, that type of underlying disruption, disruption as well as giving them documents that they can't refute. And um, I think there's the other sort of disruptions where you've got people who don't want to be part of a team or a committee but are happy to create peaceful public walks and have the energy vision, which, you know, that's not, I'm not my forte, I can't do any of that sort of stuff. I can join it but I can't act it, activate it. So I think it's what's really wonderful about um, that is that so many people work on different levels and harnessing that and facilitating that has been um, quite a privilege to see that disruption on so many different levels but it's always been for the right reasons with truth behind it with passion and integrity and professionalism and that's why I think Gloucester has done so well um, and, and other organisations like Lock the Gate, the organisations that you're in like you know, uh, it's just been um, incredible to watch that disruption being carried out with such an amazing amount of integrity. That's why I think the government can't really cope with it because they can't actually attack those people for their disruptive um, influences, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whatever the action was, was it a lot of people for the first time taking action, do you think, like the people that ended up joining the movement or were these old old, old hippies oh, from the oh, 60s no, just no, waiting for another lot, chance for a fight? No, <laughs> there, were a lot of, there were a lot of very new people got involved mm -hmm. on Maybe an action level. People. people in their 80s, people, you know, in their 90s, kids, um, a lot of people got involved. I think it, it united a lot of people in, um, I think they had the same philosophy and they just came together with the common bond. Mm -hmm. But I found, I think, when you are just bringing in the partnership thing. I think John and I were both involved and I think that's a hard thing to have two partners involved in the same fight. I think it puts a strain on your relationship. 
you have to um, always make time out for yourselves. I found that, that to be a challenge. I'm pretty sure John probably did too. But um, no, there were all sorts of people involved. It was amazing. Christian groups, non-Christian groups. Down at the gate, we'd have people praying. We'd have a Buddhist praying. We'd have um, someone doing Tai Chi and meditating. We'd have a Christian guy. We had... Who else did we have down there? And there were four sitting there all the time. Alan Poggett, who was a, a Buddhist. So, yeah, a lot of people. So you mentioned time, taking mm. time out. Like, what kind of other things did the rest of you find important in sustaining you in something that... I mean, this is a years-long thing. It wasn't just a matter of a you know, six months of getting paperwork together and so what kept you going over the years was it, it sounds like it wasn't just the hope of victory. But... I guess for me, I've got an incredibly supportive partner in Gary who is very even keeled and I've had some really down times where I've found it hard sometimes to function some days with it all but that's because I've been going through the whole council stuff as well and I mean it's all been an incredible experience but I'd lie it if I was to say that it hasn't knocked me for six mm -hmm. for a fair bit. But I think one of the main things that sustains you mm -hmm. is your friendships, your relationships with people, their integrity, their trust, their kind of wanting to be part of this social justice movement. And I just firmly believe in people. I think people are absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I refuse to be cynical and that's a waste of energy um, yeah so for me it's my partner my family and my friends and people that I work with and seeing the wider movement and of whoever it is for whatever social justice or justice issue it is I think it's um, really sustaining and making downtime I think making time for just getting together going laughing yeah we did a lot of things socially to, to uplift each other. Sustainable futures. Yes, sustainable futures. That's been a and, really and cuddling thing. a baby, cuddling grandchildren. That was, <laughs> I just used to race down and see them, and it would then I'd come back and I'd be all motivated again. So and yeah, and a good a good relationship. You couldn't do it without a strong relationship. You both in it together. I think a positive that come out of it is that people have had to really decide where they stand. A lot of the community, you know, a lot of us sat on the fence. Uh, probably I was one of those at the beginning. Um, and a lot of our friends have, you know, kind of had to think about it a bit more seriously about community, about um, the, the climate and things like that and realise, well, yes, I've got to make a decision one way or the other. So in that way, it's people have come to realise their commitment and their responsibility to this earth, I think, so a bit more than they would have. Um, there's others that have refused to come into that conversation, but I think that a good thing has been that people have rallied round and the walks brought more and more people in that you wouldn't have expected. Mm. Jenny, what about you in terms of what sustained you or other people that you've noticed in the movement? Um, for me, sometimes it was new people coming on board. As um, Hilary mentioned, occasionally there'd be fencers who would get involved and get activated and that would spur me on a bit. Um, I think anger motivated me a lot of the time. <laughs> Just the the absurdity of government and company decisions along the way um, would reignite my anger. I just, it was just some of the things I did were so outrageous that you know I, I might have been thinking I'm going to back off now. I can't keep going with this, and then the government and company would collude um, to break the law or change the law, and that the anger and outrage of what they were doing would spur me on. Um, definitely. There was a spiritual component. Sometimes, you know, you, I'd just hear a song on the radio that would speak to me at that moment. Um, like one, one example, <laughs> we were driving to Sydney to meet some politicians and I was thinking, oh, I was pretty nervous about it. It's not really my <laughs> anything that I've been involved with before at that sort of level. Um, I'm wondering whether there was any point to it. And then a song came on the radio, it's like, we are more than conquerors in Christ. <laughs> And that kind of thing happened quite a lot with me. I just get these little, they felt like messages that would, would spur me on and give me some hope and encouragement that I was doing what I was meant to be doing at that time. Um, and then 
it would be okay. Um, yeah, I guess support of other people in the movement as well, um, who felt the same way as I did, just talking to each other, uh, particularly the people you've got here today, so Julie, John, Jeff, um, Sue, um, and the people at the Needing Notice as well, um, who would come up and just say thanks for what you're doing, you're doing a great job, um, also sharing our disappointments in what was going on. Um, yeah, that sort of camaraderie really helped to keep going. Um, for me, it was a, a bit different. I couldn't go to many of the social things. So, I mean, because I had kids and jobs and family and, and a house to look after, um, any time I wasn't working on a campaign, I was dealing with just life. So, <laughs> the, sometimes there were social things and, and I couldn't go to them, so I didn't get that kind of release, you know, that kind of positive stuff. But... Yeah, I, th I still did get support along the way, um, which really helped. And sometimes people who, you know, you kind of be a bit annoyed that they weren't active and, and weren't joining in the fight, um, but they just stop on the street and just put, put their hand on your arm and say, I'm, I'm with you, you know. I, I can't walk with you, I can't fight with you, but I'm, I'm with you in spirit, and that would really help a lot as well. Yes, Jay, Jason hasn't, hasn't asked me to say this, but <laughs> as, it, as it turned out as, as well, Uniting Earth Org, so the agency that Jason works with, which is a, which is a micro agency of the United Church, um, they were really helpful as well. I mean, um, they produced a great pamphlet, oh, and, yes. um, yeah. and, and that we use that extensively throughout the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, that was John Brentnall. He was one yeah, of the, he's one of the authors. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, he was one. yeah, that's right. And um, and so, and it, so it was really interesting that and, and the United Church in, in, in general was was uh, very supportive of, of the position that, that that we were taking, I suppose, in all kinds of ways. But I mean, I also just mentioned Jason's colleague Miriam. Um, uh, she uh, she used to ring me up every every couple of months and just say, "Well, you know, how are you going?" You know, and uh, and so that was that would usually ask, last as a you know half an hour, three quarter of an hour phone call, whatever, and uh, and and so having that kind of support from from your colleague Miriam was was, was fantastic as well, and um, and I suppose it was that there there was the, the situation within Gloucester where although the United Church as an agency or as a church within Australia was very very um, clear on on its uh, anti-fossil fuel uh, position, including um, anti-coal seed and gas position. Um, we certainly have people, had people in the local church that, that looked at things from quite a different perspective. And I suppose, you know, the number one perspective really that people look at this from, and it's the same now with Rocky Hill, is, is this assumption that there's going to be a whole lot of employment that's going to flow out of, out of a project such as this. And, and just that alone seemed seem to um, mean that for, for, for many, many people, um, and, and some probably didn't have the opportunity to have a good look at the information that, that, we, that was being provided, but the fact that it, there would be employment for the town, it would bring money to the town and those kind of things, they seem to be the things that, that uh, the people that were very pro the project were, were, uh, were, were expressing. And, um, but you know, it, it it did seem to me that you know, once you got to a situation where you really um, spent a lot of time trying to understand what the potential impacts uh, are for, or were for a project such as this, and are for a rocky hill, um, that that it's just impossible to come to any other conclusion than than that it was, this was going to be a terrible thing for Gloucester and its people. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, see before we uh, so before. Because I want to talk about the sustainable futures thing, but Sue, did you have anything you wanted to add about what sustained? Yes, uh, yeah. What sustains me uh, continually is um, uh, the beauty of the earth, and I've got to go make sure I um, keep connected to that and um, have, yeah, I guess, uh, time in, in nature, and that uh, kind of re, like that realization of that awareness and that uh that it, it is so beautiful so sacred and that uh yeah that, that 
not only makes me sustained as far as needing to protect it, but, but provides me with a new energy source. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so maybe just to kind of finish, um, clearly part of the group's hope was to make sure there was no CSG in the valley and to stop the expansion of coal, but then you also began the sustainable futures, which is presumably about looking at creating other, so not just stopping stuff, but what you want to create. So could someone tell us a little bit about how that came about and what the experience of Julie would adding that into to. the mix was? Julie, do you want to kick off? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so probably. Um, <laughs> look, one of the things that um, throughout the whole fight and throughout the many, many years is always the need to give people optimism and also practical ways to deal with what's going on around us. And there is a lot of optimism out there. There are a lot of areas that people can move into and be very practical and also kind of create that positive change, and especially in the sustainable renewable energy areas, but sustainability across everything, you know, whether it's faith or whether it's how we live or relationships, etc. So we're having groundswell meetings that were becoming pretty kind of bogged down in fighting and uh, there was myself and Sue and Kerry Hardigan who decided that we needed to actually work on something that was giving us some hope and we came up with the Sustainable Futures Convention and that's happened twice now. We've, uh, we're having another one in March next year and the wonderful thing about Sustainable Futures is it's bringing together a lot of people to have a different conversation, a really enlightening and positive conversation on the future and where we can go and where we can put our energies into and the sense of hope from that and Sue, Sue's been heavily involved and many others. It's run it's by women. women. It's a woman um, thing. <laughs> and uh, men, men are welcome, but we kind of yeah, find that we kind of not. They're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, welcome to say something you <laughs> And I think, you know, Jason, you've been part of it, but Amanda, mm -hmm. Carl from, from um, Brisbane on the next economy and the new economy. Mm -hmm. But just also having um, the ability for people to come together and work in a way that is hopeful for the future and Energise Gloucester came out of that which is our group in Gloucester that working on renewable energy projects they've already um, been successful with one on the neighbourhood centre putting solar panels uh, but I think um, how it so but that's a very negative word I think it's incredibly successful and it's been really a pleasure to work on another level with another great team. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. Um, as a male, can I say something? <laughs> no, not, not a defence, but I think uh, one of my real changes of attitude the last few years has been the realisation about, uh, about how uh, men, uh, white Anglo-Saxon men, have, have undervalued and mistreated women over so many years. And it's been an inspiration to see uh, how many strong, articulate, um, in, women of integrity have got involved in this movement, and it's been an inspiration to me. And uh, and my, you know, um, gradually your attitude changes. Mine has, I'm sure, and I'm sure a lot of other men's attitudes changed who've been involved in this. And uh, you know, it's just fabulous to see the terrific women who've been involved in this. And I don't feel the least bit jealous or, or offended by being, you know, not excluded. They don't, you don't feel excluded, but. You've got to turn around and say, "Wow, look what they're doing! It's fabulous!" And uh, so, you know, we don't—I don't think Jeff would feel <laughs> that we get—we're getting excluded. No, you good and blokes. Yeah. They're good blokes. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're very, very good blokes. But yeah. the leadership of women, women, uh, uh -huh. women has has continued in the in the Rocky Hill campaign, yeah. really. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and uh, so that's that's been wonderful as well. And, and as you say, John, it's been been very, very inspirational. To, 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 um, to be part of that process and to be led by, by people that perhaps have a much, a much broader perspective about things than, than, uh, than some in the male population. Mm. And did the, did the Sustainable Futures, has that enabled a different or a bigger group of people to engage with you or is it the same people Oh, no, oh, no I think... Uh, you know, yeah. No, no, I think it, 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 that's right, it can reach beyond uh, the, you know the group that is prepared to um, fight a particular campaign. It, yeah, so it, it can um, 
bring in other people. But I think the real hope from something like Sustainable Futures and, and even being involved in the campaigns is your expansion of thinking uh, that, yeah, you're not the same person who, at, at the, that you were at the start. You've undergone a process of, you know, being expanded and stretched and um, that's only a positive thing. How many yeah. people do you think have, have actually attended Sustainable Futures and have gone out and spread the word? What do you think about that? So how many people have been there like over the last couple of... Well, I guess, yeah. I think a lot. Yeah, but I think it's hundreds, isn't yeah, it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. People come. Yeah. Well, we don't know, you don't know the, the ripple effect. Yeah. You know, some you do, some we might see what's, you know, happened with Energize Boston, but we've got no idea no. where some of the other ideas have gone. Maybe mm -hmm. some come to a dead end, but, but others and others might pick up and take on somewhere else over time. I think, um, yeah, well, you never other, really know. The other thing that did come out, sorry, yeah. was, you know, what happened at the first one was we had to give our ideas of what could Gloucester be doing positively mm -hmm. and a few of us got together with refugee kind of concerns yeah. Yeah. and um, thing, yeah. out of that is a little committee mm -hmm. and we've um, been got involved with Home Among the Gum Trees which mm -hmm. uh, invites refugees and asylum seeker people to come to the country for holidays and we've um, had about six successful mm -hmm. holidays in Gloucester uh, and that really started because we wanted to do something positive and a few of us had that kind of um, yeah on our conscience I think it was more than anything else and, and I hope yeah. to do something in that regard so and also what about the um, sustainable future stall that we started yeah. too that was another thing I just another one I'd like to mention yeah. actually um, I just thought of it yeah because you know you sometimes forget where these things yeah. come yeah. from yeah. but another one that came really out of that too was um, a connection with uh, a24 and I found oh. that really beneficial uh, they came to well, Sorry, first of all, one of their presenters was at our Sustainable Futures Convention. What's A24? Uh, yeah, the name doesn't really give away anything, but um, <laughs> they're a group of people who are just interested in being completely positive, and o I think this is it, and opening your mind to saying, okay, what is possible? What is What can Australia look like? And what can we... Uh, like, giving you permission to kind of say, hey, this is what... Um, Australia was originally, this is what Australia can be, we don't have to stay stuck yeah. with what we've got. Mm. So it's almost like permission to dream whatever you want to think would be a great future for Australia and then start working on little stepping stones to get there. But we also started our own war on waste here that came out of Sustainable Futures too. So we were actually ahead of the ABC, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a stall in the farmer's market and showing people how they can live more sustainably. Yeah, so that, that came out of... Mm. But I, I, I see it, not all these things, uh, mm. th this is all about Gloucester, what we're talking about. But my hope is, and I'm sure it's the case, is that we're just a little, little brick in a bigger wall and all over the world, hopefully, small communities are doing locally things like this, and and it'll hopefully achieve a huge change eventually. I mean, it's depressing, isn't it, to look at the politics that goes on? You know, what's happening in the United States and places like that. Now, politicians have really let us down, but I think they're getting left behind. I mean, the the you know, the the um, clean energy target. The politicians keep setting it, but the community keeps overtaking it irrespective of what governments do and uh, and my hope and I, and I believe it is that this is the way the world will get better is by communities doing things bit by bit a sustainable futures here a war on waste there in a little way and it'll be a, a brick building exercise and hopefully there'll be a beautiful yes I, I, I think that too and you're gradually just changing um, people's thinking or their uh, perspectives and um, you know, like, yeah, these, just these little shifts keep happening yeah. as well. Like, it'd be great to overhaul everything, but that's, you know, you know whether they'd be successful or not, but maybe these little shifts are um, just as important <coughs> and well, they start do to... do it here in Gloucester and the group in mm. Taree and one down the road and... I think, it's, I, I think it's really exciting because it is actually... I, it, it's, it's really 
the ripple effect from everywhere, like all of the communities across the world, everyone's doing their bit, everyone's doing something. And I think that massive tidal wave of change is here already. As John's saying, the politics haven't caught up with it yet. But however, I think that we are, you know, our biggest issue now is climate change and how we cope with what's happening now already. I, I think communities are incredible, very resilient. You look at communities in India where they've got solar power now and they're, you know, some of those small villages are, are booming along. I, I feel incredibly optimistic. I just think we're running out of time, so we need to speed up a bit. Um, but, you know, I think people are incredible. And even though I'm not a person of faith, spiritually, I do believe there's a high order that's kind of, you know, there. And... Yeah, I, I, I just know that there will be good outcomes, but I can't see that, if that makes sense. Um, well, look, thank you all very much for inspiring all of us that are uh, watching this as part of the e-conference that we've got coming up in September, and hopefully we'll have a few of you at least along there to continue the conversation with people. Um, for people that are watching this video, if you want a much more detailed uh, explanation of some of the story uh, there's a book that john's put together uh, that tells the story it's the town that said no to agl was that right and the subtitle i've forgotten uh, how gloucester was saved from coal steam gas and um the subtitle yeah and so reading that gives a really um a really optimistic view i think for people in other towns all around australia that are facing similar issues and maybe here on the east coast of new south wales the towns are kind of similar in their dynamic and constitution as well. So um, thank you for sharing your story today, but also that book with us. And I will put the links on the video for people that want to have a read of that. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing some of you in September. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.